All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, when I last left you, I showed you guys how to create a very simple map um, to show us where we were at in the um, the overworld and um, how to change that. Yeah, see, it's not allowing me to move unless I press M. Okay, there's there's a bug with the map. Uh, I guess we'll we can figure that out later. Um, but yeah, so today what I'm going to show you how to do is um, how to do very simple AI. So as you can see here, I have a monster or an enemy. He goes back and forth on this little tiny platform and whenever we are in range he will fire at us. So as you can see here he's not firing anything and then when I walk up close to him he starts shooting projectiles. Um, and then after that I will show you how to do a boss. Hopefully this isn't loud. So yeah. So I'm going to have a trigger. Once it's been triggered we're going to make sure that the player can't leave until the boss is defeated. And then I'm also going to show you how to get it so that the um, the bullets only affect the monster once it's a certain part of its body is hit. As you can see here, my bullets aren't doing anything unless it hits the stem in the middle. There you go. And now that he's been defeated, our door is open. Yippee dee doo da! Open here, and then we come here, and as you will soon see, the boss stays defeated. So yeah. All right, with that being said, let's get started. Okay, so first things first, I'm gonna see what the hell is going on with the map here. Map HUD. Q, M key, Q free, get parent. I think it's not unpausing this, so what I'm gonna do is Okay, it's getting the Q free, but I don't see. Maybe it's in here somewhere. Yeah, I'm gonna assume this is it. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna add this line to the map, and I'm just gonna make that, sure that is set to false. That way, no matter what happens, it should, it should now. Um, make sure that we we never get frozen. Yeah, so I'm gonna do that. Hit map. Okay, good. Oh right, yeah. Okay, so that was a little problem. All right, that's that's fixed. Okay, so I'm gonna do something a little bit different. Um, since I have already um, coded everything, um, that's not gonna be needed. Um, since I've already coded everything in the other project, I'm just going to do like a quick little overview. Um, you should be, at least at this point, competent enough, or at least comfortable enough, to set these things up without me having to, I guess, baby step you through it or walk you through it. Um, it should be self-explanatory, um, what I'm doing at this point. Alright, so give me a second here. So yeah, I'm just going to do like a quick overview of how it's structured and what uh, each line of the code is doing and what variables are doing what. Okay, so let's get started on the basic enemy here. As you can see here, we have a uh, wall crawler or wall hugger. Um, originally, what I wanted the enemy to do is I wanted it to be able to like grow up on the walls and... Um, crawl up the wall and then go on the ceiling and then kind of just circle around but I spent about three days and I could not figure it out so I just did a super simple enemy instead where it would just go from side to side um, if it ever ran out of ground it would go in the other direction and the same thing is for with the wall so if, if it ever touched one of these walls left or right it would just switch directions uh, or switch into the opposite direction that it was moving so the first thing I added was a character body 2D because we want the enemy to be able to move. Then I created this, um, I used a marker 2D um, for a pivot. Um, this was originally for when the enemy rotated on the, on the walls, but like I said, I wasn't able to get it to do that, so you don't really need this. Um, but if you can figure out how to get it to you know, go on the walls, then by all means, be my guest. Um, then after that, I added a sprite, Sprite 2D. That's going to be for the uh, all the animations, obviously. This one I used an animated sprite, so it just takes a simple tile sheet 
or a sprite sheet and I just, you know, paste it across and then had it play. Um, here is the enemy's eyeballs, which is this giant blue square that you see here. Um, if it ever sees the player, which is what this little uh, signal is right here, body exit, if you can see right here, um, it says if the body uh, is in a group of player, then we're going to set a, a boolean to, um, oh, this is the exit. Okay, that's if it exits, but if it ever enters, I don't know where that's at. Oh, oh, I know where I put it at. I know where I put it at. It should be up here somewhere. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't use the signal. That's right. Um, I just created a a variable that had all the overlapping bodies, which this is a function within Arios 2D, um, and all it does is it checks for any bodies that are colliding with each other, or any bodies that are overlapping with any areas, and all I said is uh, for x, and x is going to be all those overlapping bodies in I, if the X is in the group of player, meaning if that area that's that's currently colliding or body is currently colliding, in this particular case um, it would be the bodies, uh, if the body is colliding uh, and it's in the player group, or excuse me, if it's in a group called player, then we're going to set the um, can't see player to true, and then if we ever leave that box or the eyeballs, um, then we're going to set it to false, and then I had a best had a print a statement to make sure that it was actually registering. So, you know, where the hell do you think you're going? Essentially, you know, we're running away. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's what the eyeballs are doing. And this is the uh, collision shape for that. Then down here, I have four Raycast 2D. And all Raycasts do is they just check for collisions. Um, they're very similar to area uh, 2D as far as like collisions are concerned. But um, these are just for our a select point. That way we don't have to have this huge encompassing area. But anyway, I have one for the left, the right, and then two for the ground. And um, this was to make sure that um, if it ever runs out of ground, like I showed you at the beginning, if it ever runs out of ground, so let's say this one right here, I think that is the left one. So let's say this left one here is no longer colliding with anything, then that means that it's run out of floor on the left, go to the right, and then the same thing would happen with this one. So if there's no flow on the right, go to the left. Um, I'll, I'll show you that code here um, in just a second. Let's just uh, continue explaining all these nodes and what they're doing. And then finally, um, a hitbox. Obviously, um, this is for whenever you shoot the enemy, the enemy will take damage. And then it has this little collision shape. And then finally, the body collision is just to make sure it doesn't fall through the ground. All right. And oh, oh, um, I also added a signal for the both the body and the area. So the area is for the bullet, and the body is for if the player touches the uh, enemy. Okay. Now let's go through all this freaking code because it is about 203 lines. Wonderful. Gotta love it. Okay. Let me get something to drink, and then I'll explain all this crap. So, I didn't add this first, um, but I did add it sometime later. This is another scene, which is the enemy's pin. I won't get into the code of this just yet. Just know that I'm just grabbing from this area, or this uh, scene that we have here. And um, cause that way, later on, when the... Uh, enemy uh, or the player gets close enough we want the enemy to have projectiles that it can fire um, the damage uh, I have export variables for it, both uh, for the damage the health and the speed that way I can reuse this code for other enemies if I if I so choose damage amount is how much damage they can do to the player health is obvious or self-explanatory it's its health its hit points and then speed is how fast it's gonna move then I add its um, on ready variables uh, C left, C right. These are collisions left and collision right. This is for those um, ray casts that I was talking about before. So this is just grabbing um, the left one and the right one. That way I don't have to do constantly grab this. I can just call the uh, variable. And then right down here is walkable left and walkable right. And that is these two here, which were originally called ceiling, but um, obviously I wasn't able to get to to walk on the ceiling, so it doesn't really matter, but I used it to check the floor anyway, and I did the exact same thing. Just created a variable and threw the, the path to those particular nodes in here, though I can call them whenever I need it. 
There's something else uh, that I'm not using anymore, so I'm just gonna delete this. Sorry about that. I thought it, I thought I deleted all the uh, unnecessary code, but I stand corrected. All right. So ignore that one. Uh, fall, uh, fall velocity. It's similar to when we created our fall velocity for our player. Um, if you were here at the very, very beginning, you will remember that we created a gravity variable or a gravity script, and that's all this is. That's for it's just so we can call this later and apply gravity, and then give it a fall value. So if there's ever a time when our enemy isn't on the isn't on any ground, it just falls. Okay. Next, I created an enum. Um, all an enum does is it allows us to create a list of variables and then it, it changes those variables into numbers um, as I said before I think I said in a previous video um, computers are actually very very good at um, crunching numbers a lot better than they are at crunching like strings so that's all this is doing it's just going to give us a bunch of variables I just named them um, a direction that I want them to go in which is left left up up right up right and down um, this was going to be used for the pins um, or the projectiles that the enemy fires and then after that I created a list That has all of these variables in there of the enum that way I can later uh, I could later call them for the uh, direction of the pin that I want it it to go in which creates that nice like half moon uh, Effect, I'm sure there's an easier way to do it. Um, I'm not even sure if I Needed this to be perfectly honest with you, but um, it worked so I just decided to use it all right, next up is the move direction. Um, obviously, this is if we're moving, I believe, left or right. I don't remember. Give me one second here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was to check uh, which direction I was moving, and then it was going to change um, accordingly. Then, um, like I said earlier, this is the uh, can see variable. Um, if it can see the player, then we want it to fire. And if it can't see the player, it's not going to do anything except continue to move back and forth. Um, we have a timer. This timer is to make sure that the uh, enemy doesn't just like rapid fire a whole bunch of pins at us. It, it fires a pin, gives the player a couple of seconds to readjust or reorient this, themselves after they jumped or moved out of the way and fire or do whatever it is that they need to do without being bombarded with uh, a bunch of bullets. Then we have a can't see timer. Um, once this, th this is um, in conjunction with the start timer. Once the start timer um, is started, this timer is going to count down or count up, depending on how you <laughs> depending on how you view it. And then once it reaches a certain number, we're going to turn off the timer and then reset this this um, this number here back to zero. That way, the the enemy can fire fire more projectiles if the player is close enough to it. Then we have direction X and de uh, direction Y. If I remember correctly. Move direction. Okay, yeah, the move directions, these are for the pins, the projectiles. So this one goes uh, for left and right, and then the pins are for up and down. And then we have our knockback strength. So whenever the player gets hit, uh, we have um, how far we want the player to be knocked back. Um, speaking of which, I completely forgot until just now. Um, I did figure out a way to do a better knockback system. Um, I didn't think the way I did before was a problem, but um, I noticed when I was testing that I was able to get knocked into walls from the pins. So that's just obviously not going to work. So I looked online, found a couple of uh, Reddit posts. Reddit forums and Reddit, uh, Reddit posts and uh, pretty much everybody agreed that you should be um, affecting the players um, the players movement not the players position so all I did was um, I created a knockback variable uh, vector 2 uh, doesn't need anything uh, that's just the same as uh, vector 0 0 and then has been hit um, is a boolean this uh, I have just for um, the the y-axis because the code that I found was really just for like top-down and I need it for uh, I need to be able to lift the player off the ground so added those and then um, down here I add it in the physics process I added the knockback 
uh, this lerp. I'm gonna, don't worry, I'm gonna explain what that is. Um, lerp, and then I added a couple of variables in here. And all lerp is doing is it's gonna take this value, this value here, and this value here, and it, it's gonna go in between them um, at at a particular speed. Which in this case I put uh, point uh, point two. So um, the knockback for the enemy. So when we get hit, this knockback is actually going to be filled in with uh, whatever the knockback is. So in that case, it would be oh, yeah, close that. It'd be 700 right here, and then it's going to say, okay, so where are we going with that? It's going to be up to zero, and then the speed of which that's going is going to be 0.2. So all this is doing is it's saying take the 700 uh, float that we have as our knockback speed and then slowly have it go down to zero at the speed of 0.2 or 20%. And then it will eventually reach zero and then we can get hit back, whoops. And then we can get hit back again or get another knockback. Okay. And then after that, um, we need to add it to our player's movement. Where is the player's movement? Player movement, okay. So that we need to add the knockback to the player movement. So we do velocity dot x is equal to movement dot x times speed plus the knockback of x. And then um, I want to make sure that we can go in the y. So all I said is if I've been hit, then the velocity of y is also going to add whatever the knockback of y is. And again, it's also going to take that lerp and it's going to go from 700 to zero at the speed of 20%. And that should be that. And then it should reset after a particular timer is here. So that would be here. Yeah, so once we get damaged, it's gonna say we've been hit. We're gonna apply the knockback. A buffer on X and Y axes are gonna change. And then we're gonna have nice smooth knockback and we won't get knocked into walls anymore. So, give me a second here. So that's why it still looks like it works. But now I won't, I won't go here and then get hit. And I won't like, fall into the uh, fall into the uh, door here for example so yeah okay now to explain the actual code now that I've explained all the variables and what they were doing what am I doing on time probably not good <laughs> we are at 18 minutes awesome and we haven't even got into the uh, the code yet okay so the first thing I did, uh, or I don't know if it was the first thing I did, I just see that there's a check timer here first. Um, this was the create a timer. This is just to, like I said before, um, it's gonna start a timer, which was our Boolean. And then once that is um, started, it's gonna count down the timer. And then when the timer is, reaches 150, uh, we want the timer to be equal to zero. That means it's reset the timer and then it's gonna turn off the timer. And that's again, just to make sure that the, uh, the enemy isn't rapid firing. Um, we have the enemy movement, which is self-explanatory. Um, I put in the variable of delta or the parameter of delta. That way we can use it. Um, that way if the frame rate ever changes, we the, the enemy is still at a constant speed. And all it did was uh, velocity.x is equal to speed times delta. And then we have these move directions of right and left. And that just makes it sure that it's either going in, in either the right direction or the left direction. Um, remember, these are in fact enums. So this is what? What is this? This is zero, one, two, three, four. So it's looking for zero and four here. And then if those ever match, if move directions either zero or four, it will um, adjust our our enemy's um, movement. And then we have movement slide, just to make sure that we are in fact moving. Then we have add gravity. This is just to make sure that, um, like I said, if we ever, if the enemy ever loses the ground, again, maybe you put it on a, a destructible environment piece and now it, it has nowhere to go. Gravity will take over and it will knock it to the ground or wherever. Um, I'm not gonna go over this. Um, it's, it's the same as the player. Literally, I just copied and pasted in there. Okay, shoot at player. Um, this is once this activates once the player is inside this blue square here, this collision shape. So once that happens, the can C is um, turned on, and 
if the uh, the timer hasn't been started yet, it's going to turn on the timer and then it's going to fire out the projectile. Um, all this is doing is it's grabbing the projectile from the uh, from the preloaded uh, asset scene that we had before. Um, then we're instantiating it, so we have a copy of that object. Then we're going to get a parent and add it, uh, add a child, and the parent is the current world that we're in. Um, it's going to get the projectile's position. It's going to get it on the uh, this pivot right here. Uh, it's going to get to the node of this pivot. Um, this that way, it's, it, that's a starting position. And then this rotation was for when the enemy rotated. But um, again, um, I was not able to get it to walk on the walls. So yeah, um, what it's doing here, this uh, this for loop. I should have explained this first. Is um, it's going to go through the entire list that we created of all the directions. Again, I think there's probably a better way to do this, but I was just able to get to work with this. Um, so it's going to have one, two, three, four, five. So that's five. Five variables. Um, so all I'm saying is uh, X for the range of five. So that's going to give us five different pins. And it's going to check what the direction is. And then it's going to set the direction of those projectiles in that particular axis, and that's pretty much what this is check the direction the current direction which should be i believe um whatever that that element is so it'd be like zero one two three uh or four and then it's going to say that new direction is going to be equal to the list and whatever element that it is currently grabbing and it's saying if the new element is equal to zero um, have it go in these directions, change the X and Y directions of the pin to this. Um, if it's left up, change the pin direction to this, up, and you kind of get the idea. So whatever this element uh, is equal to, change its direction accordingly. Again, I think there's a much cleaner way of doing this, but uh, it escapes me. So let's go back to shoot at player. And then, like I said, it just gets the direction and it sets it to that direction. Um, this new projectile get direction is a function that I created for the pin, which is right in here. So all I'm saying is get direction. Um, this direction that it's currently gonna be going into is equal to the direction of X and the direction of Y, and then it just applies those motions in here. This is pretty much the same as the bullet, um, all of this stuff here. So if you've done the bullet um, the way that I've done the bullet, then all this should look familiar, um, except for down here. And this is um, using the new knockback system that I had created. So when the, when the enemy's uh, pin, or if the enemy itself hits the player, we want to create a new, a new variable called getDirection. It's gonna grab the direction of the player, or the, whatever body it is, is gonna grab its, uh, its position, and then it's going to, uh, we're gonna store that into the uh, get direction so we can use it later. And then we're gonna create a brand new variable called apply the knockback, which is self-explanatory to apply the knockback. It's gonna take um, our position of that current body and it's gonna multiply it by the knockback strength, which should be, I think 700, yes, 700. And then if the knockback of y is greater than or equal to zero, apply the knockback, and this is make sure that we go up. And then it just does, um, it does the damage calculations, and then it does the knockback for the x, and then it queues free. And the queue free is just to make sure that uh, once it hits the player, it disappears, and then we do a queue free again to make sure if it hits anything else other than the player, it also queues free. Okay. That should be the end of that. Now, what am I missing? Change movement. Um, I'm going to put the visibility on. Okay, so this is the Raycast 2D. Um, wait, let me go to the wall hugger here. And I just wanna close out a couple of things here that aren't necessary. No, I need that. Get rid of that, and hide that. I just want these arrows. Okay. So as I said before, 
we want this to check to see if if it's a uh, if there's a, a ground underneath it. As you can probably, I hope you can see. It's really it's really faint. You know what? Let's do this. Where are we? We are in world two. I'm gonna take you, and I'm just gonna move you right down here. That should, that should work. There we go. As you can see here, hopefully, I'm just gonna enlarge that. Um, eventually, this little thing will turn red, and that's just saying that it collides. And when it collides, as you saw right there, it will change its direction depending on if it ever, if that ray cast is ever colliding with anything. So that's all that this stuff is right here is doing. Let me just put you back up there. Uh, where is the wall hugger? Here we go. So yeah, um, those variables, remember, it's the ray cast, it's the left one, the right one, and the two on the floor. And all it's saying is if these are colliding, left or right, change its direction. And then here, if the um, if either one of these aren't um, colliding with anything, it means you don't have a floor, change the direction so you don't fall off. That's all that's doing. And finally, the wall hugger animation is super self-explanatory. I just grabbed that one animation and I had to play. So yeah, where are we at in time? Wait, 30 minutes, okay. <laughs> so that ends that wall hugger. Um, I'm just gonna do this right now and, and exchange, uh, tell you something. Um, with the boss, I noticed that um, the missiles were able to uh, damage the enemy or the boss, um, even if the mouth was closed. So just uh, make sure that the area, um, the signal, excuse me, the signal of the area enter is activated because I did not check that and it was just going right through it. So that's just something I want to make sure I said before I forgot. And now let's go to the boss since I have just mentioned it. Okay, pretty much did the exact same thing I did with the enemy. Um, I gave it a character body 2D. I gave it a sprite. I didn't give it an animated sprite. I gave it a regular sprite. Um, the reason why is I needed the animation player. That way it could hold um, its mouth open if I needed it to. Um, that way it can have it go like this using the animation player and forcing it to do so. It was a little bit more difficult with the animated sprite. So this was a... A decent solution. Um, it also allowed me to um, grab these collision shapes here and position them, as you can see down here, um, to this. So all I did to have that happen is I... What did I do? Okay, I went to the animation player. I added a brand new animation, put new like this. I'm just going to call this delete for now because I'm going to delete it. I just want to show you this. Um, and then all I did was I just add it to the property. I chose what it was that I want to animate. So let's just say, for example, the bottom half. Hit OK. It's going to ask me what I want to um, what I want to manipulate. This is going to be the position. And then all I did was um, for the bottom half, which is this right here, I did something like, okay, I want this moved here. And then I just had a keyframe and then added it like that, depending on where it was on here. And then I just did the same thing at property. Whoops, not to that. At property to the to the sprite. And then I want it. I believe I put frame like this. And then I just essentially, for depending on what the frame was. So if I want it all the way down here. I just added the frame there, one by one. It's It was super tedious, but um, <laughs> it, it got the job done. So yeah, I just pretty much did that for both sides. Um, that way, the, the collision shapes would um, expand and close depending on um, where the animation was uh, currently at. And then I had here, I had added a stem, which is the enemy's weak spot. That way, whenever the monster was um, mouth was open, the player could hit it and cause damage. 
Right, so I'm just going to delete this right now. Animation, remove. Yes, we don't want that one. Okay. Then after that, um, I added a collision shape. Which one was this? Okay, this was the actual body itself. This is to cause it to move, obviously. And then I added two timers. This timer here was to um, have the enemy move. So I didn't want the enemy just going, let me, you know what, I'm just going to the boss room. I didn't want the enemy to just like pick one direction and just, you know, randomly pick one direction and just keep itself there constantly. So all I did was I added a timer to make sure that after a certain amount of time, its direction would change. And then I have a stop movement, which allowed the, the enemy to stop. It would open up its giant mouth and allow the player to um, fire at it. And then here I have change color. Um, this here is going to change the color of the enemy when we hit it. Um, I added a, a new animation player because I noticed when I was uh, testing it out if I had added it to the same animation player, it, it it bugs and it will cause the animation to jump and skip around for some odd reason. So I just added another one that way I can use both of these and um, at the same time without them tripping or stepping over themselves. And all I did for this was I just added a property. I added it to the spore like this and then I had modulate right there. And all that allowed me to do was to, oops, change the color right here change the color to whatever I want it and then I just whoops and then I just added a keyframe to it and then that was that so all this is doing is when I get shot or when the enemy gets shot it just glows uh, red and then turns back to its normal color okay now let's explain what all this code is doing Okay, just like before, um, just in case I want to reuse this um, like I did previously for other bosses, I have a couple of export variables. It's its name, its health, and its power. Again, all pretty self-explanatory. Um, then I have its knockback strength, obviously to um, knock back the player. Its speed, how fast it goes, uh, its movement, and which direction it's going, and it has stopped. Um, this is for our animation player, that way it does certain things. Uh, depending on whether the boss has stopped or has gone. Um, this here, um, at the very beginning, I don't know why, but it was automatically playing the animation even if it wasn't um, ready to, to move or whatever. Or in this case, I called it Awaken. So this just forced it to make sure that if the animation player was playing for whatever reason, it just stopped it immediately. Um, so that's what that was for. Then down here, I created a global variable called global data. And all this has is if whether or not the boss was defeated and whether or not the boss had been awakened. So if the boss is awakened, it means that the player is in the boss room and it's they've walked into this trigger box here that I created. Um, don't worry, I'm going to show you how to create a, or tell you how to, I created this trigger box here in a little bit. Um, anyway, so all it's doing is it's going into the global data and it's saying, look for boss awaken. It's gonna look for the boss name that we specified here. In this case, I called it Spore because that's the name of, of the, the enemy in Super Metroid. And then if it's awaken, I want you to have the enemy move. I want to make sure that its direction is changing. And then I want you to play its animations. So let's just start from the top. Um, here, attacking player. Um, all it's doing is just checking to see if the player's body has, excuse me, has entered um, has entered any of its its colliding areas, and if it has, just do damage to it and the knockback and all that other stuff. Nothing um, that's different from the original enemy. Then again, with the player, uh, excuse me, with the boss movement, all it's doing is it's getting the velocity of x and the velocity of y. It's going to get its movement times it by speed and its delta, making sure it goes into an x and y axis. And then we're going to have the move and slide to make sure that the um, character body 2D is moving. Then after that, we have change direction. And all change direction is doing is if the boss ever touches a wall, touches a floor, or touches a ceiling, we want it to change its movement. So all it's going to do is it's going to take the x-axis of the movement, and it's going to create, or it's going to, uh, we're going to use this function here. 
and we're going to put it in these parameters. And all this does is it's going to find a random integer in the range of negative 1 to, uh, to 1. So if you recall, let's see, a negative 1, 0, and 1. So if you recall, um, for the x, uh, negative is going left, um, 0 is to staying put, and then 1 is right. So all I'm saying is um, from the range of negative 1 to 1, just randomly pick one of these uh, uh, variables and stick it into the, as the x, the x, um, the, me, the x is vector, vector 2, and then it does the exact same thing for the y. That way it can either go up, down, stay still, or, um, yeah, so it can either go do whatever. <laughs> So that's what that's doing. Um, it's just collecting a random, making a random integer from negative one to one, and then setting it to that that movement. So it it um, it never get, it, that way it doesn't get stuck on the walls or the floor or whatever. And then finally the animation player. Um, this animation loop it just pretty much says if the boolean has stopped isn't is equal to false, right? Yeah, if the if the uh, boolean has stopped is equal to false then I want you to play the open mouth animation. And then, after that, um, we have our timers down here. So let's go to those timers, right? So um, to, so if it's the boolean has been stopped, then it's gonna play this. And I actually have a signal here for this animation player. And all it's saying here is I added a signal called animation finished. And what that says is, once this animation is finished, call this method here and find out what the name of that animation is. In this particular case, it's open mouth. So if the animation name is open mouth, we're going to make sure that um, has stopped is equal to true. And then we're going to have it play stopped mouth open. And all that's going to, all that's doing is, or all that's saying is, if this has been played, right and once that's finished we want you to play this one here and all that is is just one single um, image because we want this mouth to stay open that way the player can fire at them and have these uh, collision shapes out of the way and that's all that's saying so that way the mouth stays open and, and the player has a chance and then after that if the uh, once that animation is finished playing we're gonna have at has stop again equal to true and then we're gonna want it to close its mouth. So all it's gonna do is play this, close mouth. Now I just used the opening mouth um, animation and I just played it backwards. That way it, it creates the illusion of it going back and forth. Okay. Now remember, these are um, these, only, these only trigger when the animation is done playing. So then, after that, we have ourselves the timers. So all these timers are doing is once they go off, or I should say, <clears throat> give me a second, saying is um, once you add these timers here, you're gonna have um, a wait time and then an auto start. Um, once the time uh, passes and this thing times out, I want you to check if the boss has been awakened and if it has been awakened, make sure that it is that the has stopped is not equal to uh, is not equal to false or excuse me is not equal to true so make sure that um, it's it's moving essentially and then change its movement to some random some random int so it can start moving and then after that um, we're gonna do the exact same thing for the stop timer except this time I had three seconds auto started it and if the enemy is awakened then we're gonna put has stopped is equal to true and then we're gonna stop its movement, and that's all that's gonna do. So this one here causes the monster to move, and this makes sure that it stops for a set amount of time. And then this right here is to make sure that it can take damage. Um, this is not no different from the um, the enemy's um, what do you call it? The enemy's health bar or whatever. And then we have check health, and all it says is if health is less than or equal to zero. Go into the uh, global script, boss defeat it, get the name, in this case it's Spore, have that equal to true. Then after that we're going to get parent get node um, ap dot stop, and I should not have abbreviated this 
as AP because I went back here just a day later and I had no idea what the f this thing was supposed to be. <laughs> so I just put a comment here um, as audio player. So just a uh, future reference, if you're going to uh, name um, nodes or variables or whatever, make sure you know uh, what those are going to be in the future. So leave yourself a comment or just name it something a little bit more uh, obvious. Anyway, and then after that, um, we're going to queue the enemy free. Okay, and that should take care of the boss. Now for the boss room itself. Um, all I did was I created a tile map with the boss room, uh, or the uh, for the boss room. I added a door here, um, and then I added a blockade here. And all the blockade is, is um, it's a sprite with a collision shape of a static body, and its position is way up here. And all I did uh, for this was, I said if the boss is defeated and equal to true, then we can queue this free. But if the uh, if the player has ever entered that trigger, this trigger here, then we're going to change this position to right here. That way the player can't get out. So that's all it is, is saying. So if the body is in group of player, um, then it's been triggered, and then we want the door position to block that. That way the player can get out. All right. Next um, thing is uh, the AP. This is the audio player. Um, this is just to play music. All I did was I just grabbed the Ridley thing from Super Metroid and just threw it in here. You can do whatever you want. Um, if you want music, that's great. And what is the other thing I did? Oh, the trigger. The trigger, the trigger, the trigger. So all I did here is I just added a trigger, um, added a couple of um, signals. So once this thing was um, thrown in, um, I, cr I connected signals to other scripts. I think this one was added to what? What did I do? Oh, uh oh. I can actually find out right here. So one obviously was the uh, block that I just said, and then the other one was this over here. So I said if the player's body has entered the, uh, the trigger shape, we're going to have the boss spore awaken. We had an export variable here, so this will tell the uh, trigger which boss that it's going to be looking for inside the, um, inside the global data. So it's going to say, okay, which boss am I looking for? Spore hasn't been awakened. No, it's going to set this to true. And then it's going to execute all of that code that we had previously set that I had showed you. And then after that, um, we are going to have it play the audio player or get the audio player and hit play. And then we're going to cue the trigger free. That way the boss can never be triggered again. Um, and then after that, um, if the boss is ever defeated, um, it doesn't need the trigger anymore, so it's just gonna it's gonna kill us off instantaneously. And what I did to make sure that that happened is I created a script for the node, the base node for the boss room. Um, it's gonna figure out which boss it it's supposed to be. In this case, um, this is, this is the spore boss room, and then it's gonna find out, um, or once it once it knows which the which boss it is, it's gonna take the door block, make sure that it can't. It can never spawn again. It's going to take the boss trigger also, make sure it doesn't spawn again, and as well as the boss itself to make sure that it does not spawn again. So this is just to make sure that once the boss has been defeated, um, it can't be triggered anymore and you can't get locked in because it's dead. And I think that is it. Um, yeah, we're in 45 minutes. Okay, so we saved a little bit of time. I think that is everything that I did for that. Um, I did explain the missiles. Let me go here to make sure that I have some changes here. All right, I explained the knockback, uh, the huggers, export variables, the bullets. Uh, oh yeah, that's for the. Uh, I don't remember what that was for, but it's it's. I think it's because I had the ex the the bullets set to zero at some point. Just make sure your bullets export variables um, and its main scene right here has has a power level. Um, I changed the player's layers, and I can see here I misspelled that. Um, player's layers uh, to layers 1 and 2. I, I don't remember why I did this. I think it's to make sure that I collided with the boss, if I remember correctly. Um, 
you're gonna have to <laughs> you're gonna have to test and if you've been following along. Um, this right here was the uh, the missiles. Obviously, I told you earlier that um, the missiles were going right through the enemy and or the boss and still killing it. Um, I added the morph ball. Um, I'm not gonna really go over that. It's pretty pretty easy. Um, uh, it's the same as adding a bullet, except it's just checking if you're in the morph ball or not. Um, I added an extra signal to bullets to Q3 now. Um, yeah, I had to, I just um, I mentioned that that was pretty much what this was here. And then the boss room's door needed a location, which again that is self-explanatory. Um, essentially, what I'm referring to is um, once I added this door here and I added the door here. Um, all I'm saying, or all I'm doing, is reminding myself that I needed to add um, the scene to the boss room as well as the position of where the player is going to end up when it hits that. So yeah, uh, I think that's everything. Um, for the bosses and the simple enemy design, let me uh get here. Um, I hope this was uh, helpful to you <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. Um, I know I didn't do a step-by-step -step guide; I kind of just glazed over everything. But as you can see by the length of this video, um, I probably would have had to do an, two more videos to get this this out. But um, yeah, if you guys have any questions about any of this stuff here, or if there's anything you don't understand, uh, feel free to leave a comment and I will uh, try to help you out here as best I can. Make sure that the uh, missiles, yeah, good. Missiles are not doing anything out of, the, out of the ordinary. But yeah, as you can see here now, haha, <laughs> we, can, we can leave. But um, yeah, so I think the next thing I'm gonna do is um, how to clean up your code. And then after that, um, I think I'm going to end this tutorial series because there's other projects that I want to get to. Um, and I've spent quite a bit of time on this one already. But, but yeah, um, that's pretty much how you do a bare bones uh, Metroidvania. Oh, as you can see here. <laughs> oh, never mind. I did, in fact, give myself a way out. Um, but yeah, that's how you pretty much do a bare bones Metroidvania. Um, I know I didn't... Uh, explain like the grabbing or wall jumping but uh, there's plenty of other videos on how to do that so I'm not gonna waste time doing that there all right my children thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you next time uh, farewell my children